All right, everybody. Today we welcome wrestler, trainer, actor, all around good guy, Al Snow. Al, welcome to another wrestling podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You also forgot magician to the blind. Well, obviously, yeah. I can't believe I left yeah. that out. They love card tricks. <laughs> I just got to say to the uh, to every trick or they don't want anything to happen. You know? <laughs> Well, How do you do inter- it? I, ne- I inter- never know. This this interview is already going better than I thought it would, so that's that's a plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also uh, read books to the uh, deaf kids at the library on Sundays. <laughs> I think we could pretty much end it right there. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to get back. You know. <laughs> and uh, Andy, the ph- philanthropist too. So mm-hmm. I am a philanderer too. <laughs> So, we're just going to get right into it. Um, sure. You know, you've wrestled for most of, if not every, major wrestling promotion during your career. Um, a, a little known fact may be that you spent some time in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Uh, what do you remember most about your time when you were in Smoky Mountain Wrestling? Uh, gosh. Um, just, you know, it was, aw- it was awesome. I think it... Honestly, at that point in time, I really was at like hitting my stride just mentally and physically, like it all kind of came together. Unfortunately, I didn't quite grasp a lot of the lessons I had learned for years on the, on the, in the territories and stuff um, until later. Um, I wish I had, I would have been able to make more better use of that time uh, there. Um, but really, things were really clicking for me at, uh, at that point. And uh, speaking of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, you teamed with Unibomb, uh, for everybody listening that's Kane out there today, uh, to make up the dynamic duo and even won the Smoky Mountain Wrestling tag titles. Uh, since you were mostly known throughout your career as a singles wrestler, how did you like tag teaming back then? I loved it. and Actually, I did a lot of a lot of tag team wrestling, even, you know, as far back as when I first broke in, in, in 82, um, it seemed like, um, I did more of that. I think over the last near, nearly 33 years, I've done more of the tag team stuff. It seems like than I have just singles things. Um, and I've always enjoyed it. It's all, you know, you get a different, uh, dynamic with each, guy that you work with um and uh it's always interesting to see how it, it plays out all right okay now you're arguably best known for your time that you spend ecw um do you think that your time in ecw was your best run um i think that it was you know i think it was probably my uh most successful in regards to truly making myself an attraction making myself uh, a thing that sells tickets um, that motivates people to leave their house and, you know, come to the event. I think that, you know, it, it all kind of was the right place, right time, right thing. And in spite of me sometimes, you know, being a little bit semi oblivious to it working <laughs> and not understanding why it was working at the time. Uh, I think it, uh, you know, I think it was probably one of the best times in my career. All right. Uh, it was in ECW, too, that you developed your character and its counterpart, Head. Uh, I can't believe I'm asking this, but can you tell us how you got Head? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, at the time, I had been under contract with, and was still under contract with, uh, at that time, WWF. Um, and, and when I first started with them, they didn't have, you know, I think the first wrestler to ever get a downside guarantee, which means that you make no less than, um, you know, your opportunities and all that, the sky's the limit. Um, which it truly was, but, um, meant that you would make no less than a certain amount of money per year was Mark Merrow in WWF. Until that time, you know, the only thing that you were guaranteed that they would use you 12 dates a year at a minimum of $100 a date, which was basically 12 TVs because they did TV once a month. And 
that was it. So if you didn't work, you didn't get paid, um, which is how the rest of the business really operates. Um, you know, if you were you were not one of the two things, which is you're not the thing that sells tickets or one of the things that helps sell tickets, um, there's not much else mm-hmm. for you. And, uh, you know, I became, uh, due to my own mistakes and uh, not seeing things clearly, you know, and missing opportunities, uh, or not properly taking advantage of some of them, um, I uh, became very frustrated, very frustrated. And I was doing the Leaf Cassidy character at the time that they had given me. You know, I started kind of playing that frustration out in the ring. Um, and at the same time, you know, Paul Heyman was just starting to create a relationship with WWE. And um, thanks to God bless his heart and soul, Chris Candido, I spoke to him. He spoke to Paul and got me put on loan to ECW. Because a little known fact, I tried to quit hmm. WWF. I tried to put in my were asking for my release from WWF at the time because I knew if I stayed there, it was just it wasn't gonna, you know, I wasn't gonna go any further. I knew I had to go someplace else um, to truly get myself over and and rolled my contract over for for the option for the year. Um, so I was really, really upset and um, really frustrated. And then, you know, Paul went to Vince, and and basically I was put on loan to ECW, and. Um, I knew when I went there that it was my chance, it was my opportunity to get myself over and make myself something that either Vince would pay to get back or Paul would pay to keep or Bischoff would pay to steal. So I went there with that mindset and tried a bunch of different things to show that I suffered a nervous breakdown and um, basically uh, found a styrofoam head in the back in uh, one night, because on the other side of the building, the way it used to be, um, they used to build the Mummer's Day parades there, floats. And uh, um, I had been reading a book on abnormal psychology, um, and there was a case study of a woman who was, had paranoid schizophrenia where she heard voices, but she, she had transference disorder, meaning she heard the voices from inanimate objects and then transferred the sickness onto the inanimate objects. I mean, they, she thought they were crazy, not her. So I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to this styrofoam head and I'm going to treat it as if it's a real person. And it's crazy, I'm saying. And for whatever reason, it clicked. <laughs> so, and I think that might be because it was, it became a voice for my frustration. Um, you know, people could feel it and, and I did it in a way that was sarcastic and, uh, was entertaining and amusing mm-hmm. and, you know, with, you know, and I really tried to put depth into it and believe it when I did it. So, you know, thank God, you know, to the grace of God and the plastic head, I, you know, I had a career. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this has been, I think, a couple of years back, but WWE ranked you um, in the top 30 ECW stars. You were ranked number 28. Um, where do you think you rank among ECW's greatest performers? I don't know. That's a matter of opinion, you know. Um, you know, I'm going to say number one. Yes. You know, and then other people are going to say, you know, of course, if you ask Sam, man, he'll say number one. Yes. If you ask the Dudleys, they'll say number one. If you ask Kaz, he'll say number one. And I, I you know, I think, uh, you know, ECW in and of itself was, there, there was no one person who was bigger than the whole mm-hmm. um, in ECW. And in fact, to that point, uh, and I've brought this up before, um, Paul Heyman was, was, was brilliant in that he got the company itself, which we still talk more about the company than we do about the individuals in the company. If yes. you realize that, um, we don't say, well, oh, Tommy Dreamer this or Raven that. We just say ECW all the time. Shane Douglas, mainstay from, you know, when, he, when it first became Extreme Championship Wrestling, threw down the NWA heavyweight title. Did we mention his name? No, we mentioned ECW. 
because Paul Heyman was brilliant in getting the company over so much so that if what you needed to do because that way because the talent was transient and didn't stay then that way he never had to worry about a collapse if a particular talent left the company itself still survived because the company itself was still over that's why everybody chants ECW and doesn't chant for a particular talent you never heard them chant for saying that you heard them sing along with the interest but you never heard them chant for them. Mm-hmm. you never heard them chant Tommy Dreamer you never heard them chant Anything. Uh, well, they did chant head, which, yeah. but, but that's because I made it a, you know, a point to get the head over. And, you know, the company itself was so over, you know, and I tell guys all the time, you know, look, you go to WWF or, I mean, a WWE event, you ever hear them chant for a WWE? They don't. Because Vince makes sure the talent are over. Because he can afford to do so. Because the, WWE itself is an iconic brand. So he puts all the focus on the talent. Paul Hamlin was smart. He put all the focus on the company itself so that he could survive departures because the company itself was what was, was truly over. So number one performer in ECW, I would have to say would be ECW. There you go. Itself. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, you were given uh, several different gimmicks during your career in WWE, other than you know Al Snow. Uh, which was your favorite gimmick? And th- out of all the other guys, was there one that was just your least favorite that you hated doing? No, uh, you know, I had Avatar and I had uh, Leaf Cassidy. Um, there were proposals of other, you know, I got to use a gimmick that I had done, and I got to do other handful of times called Shinobi, and then. Uh, um, you know, uh, there was a proposal at one point for me to be the world's greatest Mexican wrestler, um, <laughs> you know, um, with a bilingual Puerto Rican midget as my manager. <laughs> um, that was on the table. And, uh, you know, if I had, you know, the Avatar gimmick, you know, I would, you know, at that time, a lot of people don't realize I had been a heel, a, you know, basically a smart ass chicken shit heel for 14 years, you know, and working a lot. I mean, this is basically all I've ever done. So I was working as a heel and had just come off the run and spoken up as a heel. And now I'm going to go out there and, you know, just so you, you know, when I had spoken to, Vince and I had the conversation about the gimmick. Every all the stuff you see, as far as the the vignettes and everything that were done for Glacier, mm-hmm. that was kind of what was laid out to me that was going to be done for this Avatar gimmick, because I was coming out with something a totally different idea where I was going to come out as myself, put the mask on, and wrestle, and then take the mask off and whoa, I'm still myself, you know. So it wasn't being used to conceal my identity. So there had to be some kind of explanation. And then the next thing I know, and you know, it was my opportunity. It was my chance to make the most of it. And and I didn't, um, obviously, but I was put live on raw with a mask that didn't quite fit, that I couldn't quite see out of in a ring that, you know, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff off the top rope because at the time I was doing a lot of springboard stuff and in ropes that literally were never tightened up because and were stretched out because the guys were so big. You know, so I have one lackluster appearance on Raw, and then we got a couple house show matches shortly after that, and then just sat around, you know, with that gimmick, right. um, because they didn't know what to do with it yeah. themselves, you know, and, and, and I didn't, and, and, and they never gave me any direction with the character, and really that's my responsibility to try and create the character myself, but it's kind of hard to figure out. Sure. Hey, I'm going to carry a mask out, put it on. Then, you know, then I think the idea when speaking to events at the time, you know, Power Rangers were very popular. Mortal Kombat was very popular. I think he wanted to capture that to some degree in the ring, but it, that's the vision of that and the reality of it are two different things because the vision is of a TV show that's been edited together in quick clips with, and usually it's a, a group of, people fighting where in wrestling it's you know 
completely different. And, you know, maybe I could have, now I know looking back, I could have made it possibly work. Um, but then at that time, and, you know, not having proper focus, uh, I didn't. Now, something that I've always wanted to know about, and you hear about it every now and then, it'll come up whenever they talk about Stone Cold and how he got a list of names like Chili McFreeze and Dagger McFrost and all that stuff. Upon yeah. them telling you that you were going to be Avatar, did you get to see any of like the concept, like the drawings, or have any input on that, or were you just kind of told, here here you go? I had some input, and uh, you know, outfit-wise, and, and, and you know, I even tried to find a better name an avatar you know but i couldn't come up with something better so kind of that was what it was and uh you know but i didn't get chili you know get, get a list of like chili mccree's or day da- you know <laughs> yeah. ice dagger um yeah. i didn't get any of those no i just got avatar that was it but i did get you know the design people uh gave me like four different outfits to pick from you know, styles, and I, you know, picked the one that um, we saw. Okay. Now, um, I, I love, I have to ask this, and I'm sure it's one of your most asked questions, but you've been involved in a, a many different types of matches over the years. What would you say, or would you say that your Kennel from Hell match at Unforgiven 1999 is the strangest you've ever competed in? Uh, undoubtedly it's the strangest and probably the most aggravating. Yes. Um, the most aggravating from the sense that I'm always held responsible for the damn thing, which I should be. Yeah. But when the, when I was first approached by Vince Russo and, you know, everyone else about doing this angle, um, my first thing that came out of my mouth was, well, we're going to have trained animals, correct? Well, of course we are. We're going to have trained animals. Well, anybody in entertainment will tell you that you don't work with two things. You don't work with children. You don't work with animals. You know, doesn't matter what it is, but <laughs> especially in wrestling, for Christ's sake. So first thing I don't know, we're going to train animals. Yes, we're going to train animals. Okay. I get Pepper. Pepper was a uh, chihuahua, wasn't trained, was literally found by them calling uh, a veterinarian clinic and getting an owner and bringing me a, uh, a chihuahua. Okay. Oh man. So now I begin again. You know, when we get to this match, you need six to eight animals that are all highly trained by one individual who will stand outside the cage and they will listen to everything he says, and they'll do what he does commands. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you understand this. And I, I can't emphasize this to you guys enough. How many times I brought up the importance of the fact that it had to be several animals trained by one, you know, by individual or individuals all from the same place so that these dogs will all operate at the same time, the same way. Okay. Fast forward. Let's go to Charlotte, North Carolina. Walk in that day. Literally, there are eight dogs standing around with eight different people standing with them. <laughs> Much to my chagrin, I find out eight different owners oh, no. who were literally called that morning because they called a veterinarian clinic to get a list of owners of Rottweilers, and one had some obedience training. So we've literally <laughs> spent months building a story around dogs that now. We can't use because they were fighting, fornicating, urinating, and defecating to where you couldn't show them on TV. Oh, no. So, you know, it was a great concept. Would have worked if somebody would have just simply taken the due diligence to actually follow through and gotten trained animals. Yeah. Now, uh, the whole Kennel from Hell match came about after the Big, Mo- big Boss Man tricked you into eating your own dog, Pepper. Uh, now, yep. what was the truth to the story that um, we heard about Mr. Fuji doing something similar in real life? Is there anything you oh, tell, yeah. us, tell us about that? That was, that was the, that was the uh, inspiration for the whole angle. Well, that and Vince Russo had watched uh, Son of Sam and in the movie Son of Sam, the you know, you heard voices from a little dog. So, 
Um, they had numerous times tried to kill the head, and for some reason you can't kill that thing. So, <laughs> um, but so I agreed to do it, and you know, talking to the dog and, and all that stuff, and uh, we, uh, um, they, you know, the inspiration for the angle was Mr. Fuji. Because he had a neighbor who had a dog that barked all the time, and Fuji hated the dog. And from all accounts, Fuji was a very cool river. Like he would rib people, but in a very malicious way. <laughs> and he literally killed the dog, ground it up, invited the neighbor over as a console to console him, and gave him dinner, and fed him his own dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I don't even know how you go forward with that, but we're going to try. Um, yeah, that was a doozy. Yeah. So, um, I, we've seen some interviews and stuff to talk about specifically about the job squad. Um, it was one of my favorite things. I don't know if I was just, if I got kind of what was going on before I knew what was happening, but, um, a lot of people think that that was kind of a dig at your status in the world of professional wrestling that you guys were. Not at all quote-unquote jobbers but it's it's safe to say that it's that the opposite right it it had nothing to do with that it was because a jobber because a lot of people think they know the terms and understand the terms and you know even guys in the business don't even know what a jobber is and we don't have i haven't had them for probably 20 years more a jobber when you're on tv and you go to the live events as we call them now used to be we just go to house shows or spot shows um, when you were in the territory and you were able to be, you were booked on the actual event, TV, whether you won or lost, was an opportunity. It was a commercial. It was a chance for you to sell yourself and be one of the two things, whether you to be retain sales tickets or one of the things to help sell tickets. So when you are a professional wrestler, it's never looked at as a job. It's always looked at as a business partnership. And, um, guys would be brought in to TV and they were brought in specifically just for TV, meaning they didn't do the events. They didn't make any additional money from whatever the attendance was at those events. So it was just a job for them. They were paid for a task, which was to put over, elevate the talent that would be going to the events. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Hence absolutely. the term jobber. Yes. That disappeared ages ago. So the job squad was was a, a joke I had made in catering one day to Jim Cornette because at the time they had an angle where everybody had a gang. And, you know, the most bleak was, the, you know, not to mention the, the guys, because we were all idiots, had, were starting to make gangs in the locker room, like real gangs. Mm-hmm. Like truth and talk and stuff that was retarded. <laughs> so, and a couple of these people really believed that when they won, they kind of won. Like they really thought they won, you know, and they kind of, I was always running with the attitude of the belief that when, if I let you win, that's doing you a favor. You know, I'm doing the favor and I'm doing it because we're all going to make more money because we figure you're going to be the thing that's going to draw. And you can't be the main event without the opening match. And the opening match can't be the opening match without the main event. And you can't win without somebody being willing to lose. So there were people who thought they were entitled to win or that they were actually winning. And I was like, this is ridiculous. It's absurd. <laughs> you know, so I said, well, you know, I told Cornette, I'm going to start my own gang. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm going to start my gang and it's going to be the most powerful gang in all of wrestling. <laughs> what do you, what do you mean? Well, Chris Candido, Barry Horowitz, myself, Kyle Pritchard. I started listing all the guys off that, you know, pretty much, you know, on a regular basis would get beat. Not all the time, but, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm calling the job squad. Because I was thinking of paper towels, you know what I mean? I said, you know, you have to wipe them out with us. And he goes, how are you going to be the most powerful people in the business? I said, very simple, Jim. I said, Undertaker goes out and tombstones Barry Horowitz. Barry stands up, dusts his hair off, and walks out. We had to tell him <laughs> because you got to remember, you aren't really beating me, so you don't really win, so I don't really lose. 
And I told numerous people, now, if you would like to try to really beat me, go right ahead. You might actually do it. But it's going to come out. It's not going to be as entertaining. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, that's great. So, yeah. I went to ECW, you know, explained it there. Oh, everybody loved it. You got to make shirts. We all belong to the job squad. I mean, everybody wanted to belong to the job squad. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, so I started giving people agent names and, you know, uh, counterintelligence names and so it was like a secret organization we were fighting the organization push because none of us got one so um it just you know road dog wore uh i had a gray shirt that said property of the job squad uh kissing ass isn't in our job description and on the back can you pay me because it was like you're going to pay me the same whether I win or lose. What does it matter? Because what's the one thing at stake in wrestling? Because there's only one thing at stake in wrestling. It's always been the one thing at stake in wrestling since the 1800s until now. It's never changed. Just the finish. So whenever you guys get these jack-offs on your interview to do your blog, your radio show, and they tell you, oh, well, the business has changed, horseshit. Because until you come up with some new thing at stake, it's the exact same thing that we were selling in 1914 and the exact same thing we're selling in 2014. <laughs> it's evolved. It's gotten more sophisticated. We're still trying to get the audience to buy into that the win and loss actually matter. Uh, Granted, it's still just as fake, meaning you don't really win. <laughs> well put, well put. Uh, now, Al, uh, at its height, you know, the Jibe Squad had five members, including yourself. If you could recreate it today with anybody from the past or present what other four people would you choose? Have you ever had this in the back of your mind of who else you would want to add to your own job squad right now? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, I had no idea. <laughs> that was, you know, at the time, and I'm not bragging, I was pretty over with the head. And I think that was a way that Russo tried to put those other guys with me to kind of use that, you know. Sure. I don't know. I don't know. That's just speculation on my part. But it was, you know, but it was entertaining and, you know, um, you know, when we were kind of the underdog group and, you know, um, it was fun, you know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, one of my favorite things. Plus I sold a bunch of oh. t-shirts too. I pulled, sold a ton of them. I got they, one. Uh, now, I know that there's a lot of wrestling sites out there that sell shirts and stuff. Are, have you got your own wrestling site? Mm-hmm. Uh, it- I, uh, the real com. And um, I'm going to be putting the Job Squad shirts back up there. I got all kinds of different Job Squad designs awesome. that I have that are pretty cool. So, and they all make some kind of statement, you know. Like I took a an old World War old World War II poster um, with a GI with a cup of coffee, and basically, um, you know, basically says, you know, uh, sit down and pour yourself a hot cup of shut the F U dash dash K up. Uh, and let us do our job, and kind of like the kissing assets in our job description. So, you know, um, that was kind of the attitude of the uh, of the job squad. And so I, you know, um, I've got to finish putting the site up and then put the job squad T-shirts out there again. And uh, people enjoy them. I still, when I go to conventions and wrestling shows, I sell them, and people like them. So. Okay. Um, one of my favorite things that you were a part of has to be the 24-7 hardcore title defense era. Um, I always kind of wondered, how much of that did you know about in advance? Well, you know about all of it in advance, but okay. I only got to be on the tail end of that. Um, when I was doing the hardcore matches, you know, a hardcore title, you know, it was just, they were hardcore matches, and then they kind of went Crash Holly, it kind of became the 24-7 rule, and that any place at any time type of thing. So I only got to do a few things with that, you know, and, uh, but it was fun. It was, you know, because you got to do some, you know, creative, off-the-wall stuff that everybody else didn't get to do, you know. Mm-hmm. That was the one most awesome thing about my character, was that people believed that I was, you know, nine out of ten people believed I was completely insane. <laughs> and, you know, probably didn't hurt. But I would, after shows and, you know, when traveling, I would take the head to dinner. You know, I'd buy two meals. 
and sit there and argue with them. And I can't tell you how many restaurants I've been asked to leave because I'm making other <laughs> customers uncomfortable. <laughs> Man, well, that would have been great to see. Uh, now, Al, you, know, you were a trainer also on uh, WWE's Tough Enough for three seasons. Uh, during those four seasons, you, you helped train uh, some of WWE's up-and-coming stars, including Christopher Nowinski, Maven, Daniel Pewter, John Morrison, The Miz, Ryback. Uh, did you guys, did you enjoy training uh, when you were on the show, and do you have any funny stories maybe from your time on Tough Enough? Oh, my God, I loved it. I loved that time with you know on, on Tough Enough. I really did. It was just such a an awesome awesome period in my career it really was um in to get to be a part of you know the wrestling business but and, and you gotta be honest i mean rest, as wrestlers we were, we were kind of the most um insecure needy arrogant narcissistic uh uh and just com- complaining group of people you'd ever want to meet and always miserable. Why? I don't know. Because really, basically, we are making our living as grown adults, fake finding another grown adult in his underwear for money. So, you know, what do you have to complain about? But Lord knows we'll find it. So, you know, to be away from all of that and to be in in that environment, and, and I always have loved to, to train and, you know, teach people and, um, um, it was it was really it was awesome, and it, there were so many great moments, funny moments that you know with the kids and you know uh, that uh, like uh, you know uh, one of the guys Jonah, um, you know he was a uh, bit of a class clown and all of that, and I convinced the kids to um, basically put. Uh, X lax in his he had like a protein drink, and then he, he got there, and then hide all the toilet paper <laughs> on him, you know. And he had he had the shits for the rest of the day, you know. Um, you know, uh, just we raided the build the mot, and I raided the house one night. And, you know, um, you take a shaving cream can, you shake it up, and then you. She had a hole in it with a screwdriver and throw it in the room and shut the door and it just sprays shaving cream. <laughs> so we were, you know, we hit the house one night and then like, like they were organized. They had watch set up, you know, because we kept, I kept threatening and messing with them and put it in their head that I was going to show up at night one night. And, you know, finally we did. And like they were organized. It was, it was hilarious. <laughs> so, um, but they finally did get me like on the last day I came out and they didn't, MTV had given me an SUV to drive, and like, um, I came outside, and literally, they had stolen all four tires, all four wheels, <laughs> had jacked it up and taken all four wheels off the car. So I was like, what the? <laughs> so, That's great. Um, and you know, with Tough Enough One, with Josh, and with Maven, we used to play lots of practical jokes on each other. And when Maven and I would travel together, that continued. We continued to play practical jokes on each other. One time, I even made me like made the TSA like pull me over, you know, when I was going through security. And I was like, Oh, I hate that. And you know, he thought it was funny. So I made sure, you know, um, I went to an adult bookstore and uh, bought a little item, <laughs> put it in, and put it right in the front of his front pocket of his uh, wrestling bag because I knew he <laughs> couldn't check that. And um, you know, I told Devon, I said, you know, Devon I was like, Look. The Navy goes through to make sure they check his bag. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. Well, then they got separated. And I was like, crap. Well, they pulled him over anyways because they found the item on the x ray, which was a giant dildo I <laughs> stuffed in the front of the bag. So they <laughs> pulled him over and pulled it out and were holding it up in the air, going, what is this? And he was like, you know, he was embarrassed. <laughs> That's great. Now, there was um, there's a clip that goes around every now and then whenever something happens with uh, Ryback, who is Ryan Reeves, um, about his um, appetite, I guess. And it's just a clip of you talking about how much he eats. Um, what, did you get to work much with him, or was that pretty much just? Uh, sure. No, I worked with you know him and Peter and Miz and um, all those guys in that group for tough on the floor. I was with them constantly just like it was one of the other ones. And, uh, 
you know, Ryan was, a, he's an awesome kid. I mean, really, you know, and very, very, you know, um, dedicated, very passionate and, um, has hung in there. You know, they, you know, there were, there were a couple times, you know, um, you know, you wonder, is he going to get it? Mm-hmm. Is he going to, is it going to click for him? You know, and he went through a lot of the same things that a lot of people do, which is trying to find yourself and find that thing that connects with the audience. And, uh, you know, he hung in there until he did. Okay. Now, um, at this point, we've only talked about your, your wrestling career, um, you know, WWE, CW, and, we touched briefly. We haven't talked anything about the magic for the blind, but you know. Well, well. and that as well, <laughs> yes. Um, but now do, you've. I also do porn for the blind. So. <laughs> I don't. I would. I would ask what that entails, but I'm really afraid that you'll answer. So. Um, <laughs> um, now you're you've taken on the duties of. Uh, I I would call it. Is it an agent at TNA or how do you describe that? Well, the older term would be uh, agent. Um, you know, newer term would be you know producer. Okay. Um, I guess. You know. So, um, what is a day like for you? You know, at TNA, what what are what are your like? What is your duties of of that job? Well, I you know we go to the uh, agent meeting you know, mm-hmm. slash producers meeting. To we'll go over the matches, determine what the business of the match is that we're trying to accomplish, um, which is really what is, you know, to help move the story forward. To does this guy need to come across as, you know, as, do we need to put heat on this heel? Do we need to get this baby face over? Do we need to create an underdog? Do we need to, whatever we need to make the audience think, feel, or believe, we discuss and we discuss how is the best way to go about that and then. It's now up to me to impart that to the talent and get them on the same page and then also help them and, and maybe a little too much, but help them put the match together in a way that then does that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. Okay. Now what are your thoughts on TNA currently? I enjoy working. I enjoy being there and I enjoy being a part of it. I enjoy being an agent. Um, I love all the, the guys. It's a great atmosphere. Terrific. You know, they all, I mean, those guys really work hard. I have nothing but respect for every single person. I, it, it's amazing. To, I've always said this, said this since I first got there. It's amazing to me what they produce in comparison to WWE in regards to they do it with probably a, only a third or less than that of the people and the resources than WWE. Yeah. And, and I mean, everybody in the ring backstage, everybody works their ass off. It's, you know, so that's it. I know that's I, probably not what everybody would want to hear. Well, I mean, but, but you're you're living true. it, and you know it's nice to hear that from somebody that's actually doing it. Because there's a lot of people out there that have high expectations on everything, and you know that's because those are people that don't listen. You know what's the most oxymoronic term in wrestling? Smart mark. Do you know why? Because it's not possible to be even for that to exist. You can't be smart to the work and be a mark board at the same time. <laughs> yeah. You know who came up with the term smart mark? Smart marks. You know why? <laughs> because they didn't want to be known as just fans anymore. They wanted to feel like because they have some information or knowledge that they are now part of a business that they've never actually been a part of. Okay? Yep. Now, guys, this may be a little known fact you don't know about Al Selma. Here, here's a here's a doozy. I love medicine. Love it. Love the medical profession. Everything to do with it. I watch every show on T V about medicine and doctors. Never missed missed an episode of Bash. I watch House, Doctor Oz. You name the Doctor show, Doctor Kildare. Watch the old reruns of Doctor Kildare from Black and White. I watch everything. Emergency. Do you, do you drink Doctor Pepper? I drink Doctor Pepper. 
I go online every day and I go to the New England Journal of Medical Science every day. I Google all my symptoms, okay? But you know one thing I wouldn't do? I wouldn't tell the doctor how to fix me. You know how? Yeah. why? Because he's a doctor. I'm not. Yeah. I'm a fan of doctors. Yes. I have never been a doctor and therefore have no experience. And since I have no experience, I don't really have any true knowledge of how being a doctor works. And the same goes for all those wonderful smart bots out there. You have no idea until you've been in the ring and had to do what you've had to do in order to generate more attendance so that you can get a better income, so you can feed your family at a much greater rate until you've actually done it. And until you've actually done it, shut up. <laughs> you're entitled to your opinion. I love your opinion. That means that you're watching. But it doesn't mean I have to do what you have you say. Because I don't care. As long as you pay to see me, I don't care what you think. In fact, if you don't like it, great. Tell me you don't like it. And, you know, I'll try to do better. Doesn't mean I'm going to do what you told me to do. It just means <laughs> I'm going to try to do better. I'm not going to do it the way you told me to do it. Because I'm trying to do something totally different than what you think I'm trying to do. So I'm the doctor. <laughs> after this has all been said, I think what we're getting from you is that you feel that TNA's best days are still ahead of them well of course you know we can, you know we compare tna to wwe all the smart marks compare wwe to tna and tna to wwe well that's an asinine <laughs> wwe has literally been in existence for decades decades it's been in existence vince mcmahon at the helm for how many decades himself since the 80s his father for how many decades his grandfather, before that, when it was known as Capital Sports out of Washington, D.C. How, TNA's been in existence for what, 11, 12, I don't know, <laughs> years? You're going to compare the two? Not to mention, if you noticed, I said, I can't believe what, we, what they produce, and that was, even if I'm not involved there, with a, even a less than a third of the resources and staff and people to do it with. You're going to compare them. Okay, so let's compare Ford Motor Company to your your Uncle Bob's, you know, <laughs> garage. That, you know, his, his car repair shop. He runs out of his garage on weekends. Yep. Why don't we do that? <laughs> well, let's compare Walmart to your local mom and pop hardware store, or I mean, you know, local mom and pop five and nine, or Lowe's to your local mom and pop hardware store. But let's compare the two, and let's see how that works. <laughs> You said, you definitely said it, Al. I hope uh, you put some of these uh, smart marks uh, and you put them in their place now. So hopefully, you know they, they they'll, actually they'll just get upset. I know <laughs> they complain about, it. and they'll they'll say, "What do you know?" Well, you're right. What do I know? You, you may know. You probably know more than I do because your knows. I've you had go. enough head trauma that I can remember my own name sometimes. <laughs> I know, uh, Al, as, as your wrestling career starts to wind down a little bit and you're focusing more on finding tomorrow's superstars, what does the future hold for Al Snow? Uh, well, I've been doing a lot of acting lately and I've uh, been very fortunate to, you know, get involved with that and, uh, and enjoy it a lot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a natural extension of... Um, what I I feel like I've been doing to a certain degree in wrestling, and uh, um, it's a new challenge and a new passion. Um, haven't you know? Not as fortunate to get some of the you know really big um, eye catching roles uh, that a lot you know mm -hmm. like Batista and a couple other people have, which is awesome for them. But you know I get to do it and do it quite often and. Um, and I really enjoy it too. Um, I've just been working on a feature film called The Body Sculptor in uh, Nashville for probably the last couple months, I believe. And, um, you know, been really ill with Tiny Lister and um, Terry, uh, Terry Kaiser. He was the lead in Weekend at Bernie's and several other. Mm -hmm. quite a few other films he's got a lot of experience um and been you know uh, not quite done filming that 
And I, you know, I love it. I mean, I've really been enjoying it. All right. Now, so, what what's the process for you when you choose your your roles? Like, do you, you get scripts and then you get to decide, or you look at up things and then you kind of pick which what one you want to do, or how does that work? Um, I really, what I don't mind playing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, role wise, I, I have a tendency to get you know the gorilla role, you know the big the bad guy or mm-hmm. you know the heater, um, you know. But I've gotten some other ones, you know, that have you know been a little uh, like a father role, and you know, um, not just you know kill 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 or scream and yell or beat this person up. I've gotten some varied roles. Um, I played in a romantic comedy. I got to play like a you know, kind of a redneck jerk um, who owned a liquor store and, um, you know, in a, a, a movie called Penny Dreadful, a picture show um, in a, like, 70s, a reverse che- Texas Chainsaw Massacre um, type movie. Um, I got to play, you know, where the family was a bunch of hillbillies and all that, and it was, you know, looked like you know, we were going to be the killers and it turned out that the teenagers that we picked up and, you know, we're going to help out turned out to be the killers. And, um, you know, I got to play like a, you know, hillbilly and, you know, kind of a simpleton. Um, you know, so I've gotten to play quite a few different, different roles and, uh, you know, and it's, it's been fun and, and a lot, you know, pretty varied. Sure. So. Now, now uh, you know, with this whole new field in a way, uh, stepping into the acting business, uh, well, so to speak, uh, is there one actor or actress that you would love to, 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 you know, to work with one day? Is there somebody that you know? You're oh f- yeah. Who yeah. Th- only the the only the only three. Um, Adam West. Um, um, William Shatner. And uh, Burt Reynolds. Oh, and uh, Christopher Walken. There you go. Hopefully one day. One day we'll see that happen. Now, William Shatner's a fellow Tennessean now, like you, right? Uh, Kentuckian. Kentuckian. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm way he off. Has a, he has a horse farm. Okay. Well, you're still somewhat close, so maybe that'll work out for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll just go by his house and hang out with him. I'm sure he won't mind. Lightning Round. Joey Ryan. Joey Ryan. Uh, the epitome of take take an opportunity and run with it. What did pepper taste like? Tasted like, sort of like, um, salted beef and um, creamed green beans. <laughs> okay. Um, and noodles. <laughs> um, name one wrestler who has impressed you lately. Ethan Carter the right. third. Uh, John Cena. A draw. Okay. Um, what is the best thing you learned from either Vince McMahon, Paul Heyman, or Dixie Carter? The best thing I've learned in wrestling is how to take shit and make Shinola. <laughs> right, uh, who who has been your favorite opponent through your wrestling career? Myself. I love me. <laughs> I can't wait to get back to the hotel room and wrestle myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and I'll do and I'll do the job too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say your greatest contribution to the world of professional wrestling is? Uh, the talent that I've trained. Right. Uh, Mick Foley is constantly poking fun at you and your career. Now the tables have turned. Is there anything funny or embarrassing that you want to tell us about Mick? Well, it's not too much I can say that, you know... Uh-huh. That would be more embarrassing than just looking at him. Um, <laughs> as far as, um, you know, his preoccupation, which borders on almost sexual obsession with me, um, 
I can only say that if it had not been for me, uh, his book would be much like his penis, a short story. <laughs> and, I think you know, that... I got to tell you, I mean, you know, he used to go around and tell everybody, you know, um, you know, how he wanted to be a stand-up comedian. We all laughed and laughed and laughed. And, you know, he became a stand-up comedian and now nobody's laughing. <laughs> Um, oh, this is a a little more serious, but professional wrestling is widely known for being a kind of a cutthroat business. Um, what of the key? What of the keys to not letting the wrestling business chew you up and spit you out been for you? Don't let it be who you are. Let it be what you do. That's good. Uh, and lastly, uh, what does everybody want? <laughs> And want, need, and love head. Lightning round. Thanks for joining us. Uh, can you tell uh, the fans out there where they could follow you or find you on you know the social media universe? Sure. Um, you can uh, find me on Facebook and follow me on there. Um, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at the real Al Snow. I know. Yes, there were some fake ones, <laughs> and I did inform them. If you're going to imitate or fake being a celebrity, aim higher. But <laughs> they didn't, so I had to just, you know, tell them that I was the real Al Snow on my uh, name, and uh, and then on Instagram, I'm the real Al Snow too. Uh, lots of interesting pictures, but most of the time uh, on Twitter, I, you know, I try not to be boring. I just put up, you know, goofy jokes and. Uh, <laughs> things like that. Um, sometimes it offends people. Well, I haven't been quite as offensive lately. I've been trying to tone that down. So. <laughs> now, where can Sometimes people follow, where can people follow you in, in real life? Like, is there a place you're going to be where they can just follow you around for a while or? Um, <laughs> pick any Walmart. I'll show up eventually. <laughs> um, those people are amazing. But let me ask them. If Walmart makes your life better, how horrible was it for these people before they started shopping? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, that's, man, these people were rough, you know? Um, you know, I, I just, I'll be in uh, Pennsylvania next weekend. Um, I'll be out in San Diego uh, December 3rd for an autograph signing. Um this coming weekend, I'll be in uh, Goshen, Indiana on Friday. I'll be in um, uh, near South Bend, Indiana on Saturday. Um, you know, I put all the information up on uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, in between all the nonsense and jokes. Um, and, um, and that's... Basically, it you know. Um, I'll be at Blizzard Ball in Milwaukee, which is an incredible annual show that's put on by uh, Dave Hero on December sixth. I'll be in Rockstar Pro Wrestling on December fifth. Um, Going to start, you know, starting that magic tour very soon. So if either one of you want to be my lovely assistant, it's not like they can tell. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect because I'm um, just hideous. So <laughs> well. That's quite all right. You know, it, it works out awesome. It's like the porn for, you know, porn for black. Did you know if you go to the to the to the uh, the National Deaf website, they have like a volume control on their videos? Really? I just found that ironic. But. <laughs> well, well, and no, I'm not making fun of handicapped people. You know, it's, I'm not. It's kind of a the whole idea of dark, dark humor <laughs> of course yeah. uh, Aldo we really appreciate your time we really thank you for joining us tonight and I know the fans out there listening really or really appreciate it too thank you so much no guys thank you I really do appreciate you having me on and giving me the time and you know any, uh, any time you want to talk feel free give me a call